Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome all those who join us on these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to check cell phones and see that they have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And our Internet viewers are always welcome to send their questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Introducing our program today and special guests is Nick Loris, who serves as our Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow in our Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. He is an economist and focuses on energy, environmental, and regulatory issues, examines energy prices and other economic effects of environmental policies and regulations, including climate change, energy efficiency, and energy subsidies. He is also an advocate and of the benefits of free market environmentalism. Before joining us here at Heritage in 2007, he was an associate at the Charles G. Koch Foundation. He has also served as an editorial intern at the townhall.com site. Please join me in welcoming Nick Norris. Nick? Thank you. Um, I might just do this from down here because I'm tiny Tim up here. Um, so thank you. thanks, John. Uh, for those of you who don't know John, he's real serious about uh, turning your cell phone off during events, which is why I have those. Uh, I learned my lesson the hard way. Uh, but thank you for joining us for what's going to be an informative and important discussion on energy-free trade, energy exports, and removing barriers to opportunity. Uh, you know, it was only a decade ago that the United States was planning to import more natural gas from abroad. And natural gas experts told us that the days of cheap, dom cheap domestic natural gas were over. Uh, and when it appeared certain that the U.S. would soon run short uh, and need imports to make ends meet, uh, it was Houston-based Chenier Energy that responded by building an import terminal in 2008. And it was with a bit of luck and good fortune uh, that Chenier ran headlong into the American shale boom and got first in line for an onerously long permitting process. And after retrofitting their outfit, Chenier is now in position to, to deliver liquefied natural gas to foreign markets beginning in 2015. And this change in the energy landscape was really born out of innovation and the persistence to develop advancements in hydraulic fracturing and smart drilling technologies. And now, not only are we the world's largest oil and natural gas producer, which has put downward pressure on prices, increased jobs, and provided much needed economic growth, we're now in a position to export not only natural gas, but crude oil, um, more coal, and more refined petroleum products. But exporting energy isn't just about the jobs and the GDP increases, although it's important to hammer those messages into the heads of uh, the anti-export crowd and the protectionist crowds. It's about going back to economics 101. Free trade is such a fundamental component to increasing prosperity and well-being. And when markets are open to more producers and consumers, competition provides people with more choice and better products at a lower cost. Opening markets to both imports and exports fosters innovation as companies face more competition and meet challenges to retain and expand their market share. And energy should be treated like any other good or service that we trade freely around the world. But the problem is the federal government treats it differently with various laws and regulations and artificially imposed barriers which restricts opportunities for Americans. And I'm pleased that we have such a great expert panel to discuss and elaborate on the importance of free trade and the positive implications of opening markets and the potential negative implications of leaving these restrictions in place. And I'm also very pleased and honored to have with us a member of Congress that's leading the charge on this issue on Capitol Hill, particularly on LNG exports, but also broadly pushing for free market policy reforms to make our energy economy even more robust than it is today to the benefit of us all. Congressman Cory Gardner has been a leading conservative voice in Colorado, where he served in the state legislature for five years prior to being elected in Congress to represent the state's fourth congressional district. He sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee and is a member of the Communications and Technology, Energy and Power, and Oversight and Investigation subcommittees. He's been a champion for opening America's domestic energy resources, approving the Keystone XL pipeline, and most recently, expanding opportunities for LNG exports. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Congressman Cory Gardner. 
Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And I appreciate, uh, you know, part of my bio at the very end, sometimes there's a little comment on there that says, uh, Corey and his wife, Jamie, and their two children live in a home uh, that once belonged to his great-grandparents. Uh, that's a true story, but the last time somebody read that, they said, Corey and his wife, Jamie, and their two children still live with his great-grandparents. <laughs> so thank you for thank you for leaving that part of it out. Uh, I do not live with my great-grandparents. Uh, but I am excited about where we are today in Colorado and our energy future. If you look at where we have come uh, in the past 10 to 15 years, we had no idea that the incredible opportunities of our all-of-the-above energy opportunity would open to the point where they are. Uh, I grew up in a little tiny town on the eastern plains of Colorado, working in a family business selling farm equipment. And I can remember years ago, one summer, we started seeing cars and pickups from out of state. We didn't know who they were. You know, we knew all the farmers around. We knew all the ranchers around. And they were coming into the parts counter, and they needed uh, filters for their equipment. They needed a hydraulic hose to be made. And so I can remember putting together hydraulic hose for, uh, for all these people that we had no idea who they were. And I finally one day said, hey, what's going on? Where, where's everybody coming from? And the answer was, well, you know, there's a new natural gas play just down the road from us. This little town of 3,000 people, I went to a high school of about 67 kids in my grade. Uh, there were not very many of us who came back to that hometown. But thanks to natural gas development just a few years ago, our hometown not only now has three stoplights in it, uh, thanks to the energy economy that's improved and brought more traffic to the town, but it's also allowed more of the kids who were leaving that community, who were leaving the economy, who moved away, to stay, to come back, to get a good paying job, to create opportunity for their families, to get a job with good benefits in an economy and a salary that pays 48% more than the average job in Colorado. Uh, to look at Colorado is a history as a resource state, a state that balances uh, responsibly all of our opportunities with the incredible environment that we have. As a good conservationist ethic, we know that that's absolutely uh, critical to make sure that we are protecting our environment, protecting our resources, and developing our energy in a responsible manner. And we do truly have an all-of-the-above energy uh, portfolio in Colorado, from renewable energy to traditional energy, from coal to natural gas. And the export opportunities that this nation faces not only drives economic opportunity and job opportunity, but also changes the balance of security around the world, giving us the leading edge when it comes to geopolitical security and opportunities. As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, we have been looking at the issue of LNG exports for months, long before uh, Russia entered Ukraine. We have the opportunity in this country to increase exports, changing that balance of power, giving our allies in Ukraine leverage over a Russian monopoly instead of invasions. We have the opportunity. As Dr. Jurgen said, Dr. Daniel Jurgen, most of you know who he is, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, author of The Quest, The Prize, uh, to truly make a difference when it comes to our security. And Dr. Jurgen testified before the Energy and Commerce Committee several months ago that because of our sanctions, because of our energy development, our energy opportunities in the United States, our sanctions against Iran are working. Uh, we've also been able to cut their energy production, their supplies, as part of the global supply network by half because of our energy, in half because of our energy opportunities at home and uh, across Colorado and this country. Just a couple of weeks ago, we passed, the House passed H.R. 6. H.R. 6 is a bill, as you know, that would expedite the permit approval process for LNG export facilities. Now, why is this legislation important? I mentioned in October, the Energy and Commerce Committee had a hearing with a number of representatives from nations around the globe who talked about what energy export opportunities mean, whether that's coal. Uh, we we're just talking to uh, some folks out in Colorado who own a coal mine, West Elk Mine, that is now exporting 50% of their coal out of the West Elk Mine. But when it comes to natural gas exports, uh, these permits that have been backlogged at the Department of Energy, uh, passing H.R. 6 in a bipartisan fashion allows us to expedite that. And according to the nations who testified before the Energy and Commerce Committee, including Dr. Anita Orban, uh, the uh, Secretary at Large uh, for, for Energy out of Hungary, uh, Ambassador at Large, excuse me, for Energy out of Hungary, uh, had said that the mere passage of H.R. 6 sends a signal to Russia giving us more leverage, giving Ukraine, Hungary, other nations more leverage uh, to enter negotiations with, with Russia and other nations for energy contracts, even though the bill itself may not have crossed the president's desk. And so for these nations, the mere passage out of the House of Representatives sends a signal to the market, a signal to the world, that we are serious about energy security and energy opportunity. 
The two benefits of H.R. 6 and legislation when it comes to energy uh, are these, economic and security. Number one, uh, from H.R. 6 point of view, we could eliminate 45,000. We could reduce the unemployment rolls by 45,000 people as a result of H.R. 6 passage. But it also, again, going back to statements by Hungary, Ukraine, it gives us a new balance of power tilted our way when it comes to dealing with our allies who are desperate for energy security. And I think it's important at that point to look at the vote itself when H.R. 6 passed out of the House of Representatives. Not only did it pass with overwhelming support, but it had about 50 Democrat supporters as well. And looking at the voters, looking at the vote count of those 50, House leadership, Democratic leadership, including from states that have moratoriums and bans on hydraulic fracturing. People who supported the export of HR6 come from states who may have bans on hydraulic fracturing in place. That's important to talk about because if you ban energy production through a hydraulic fracturing ban, you do not have enough natural gas. You will not produce enough natural gas to export. It's that simple. People realize that this fight we are having in this country over LNG exports transcends the local fight people are having over uh, a hydraulic fracturing ban because they understand the benefits that come from energy production and energy exports. Uh, by 2038, we could see a $25 billion boost to our GDP through LNG exports. Job creation, international security, and the opportunity for the United States to take a leading role in energy development. That's this debate. And of course, I hope that the Senate, they announced recently that they will not be moving the bill forward, at least before the August work period. It is my hope that the Senate will move forward on legislation. Senator Hoven from North Dakota recently introduced a bill similar to H.R. 6 dealing with the exports of LNG. But the opportunity that we have is real, and the opportunity is now. And to oppose this opportunity, to stop this opportunity, to ignore this opportunity, would be the equivalent of hanging up on a 911 call from our friends and allies for help. And so thank you to Heritage. Thank you, uh, Nick, for the opportunity to be with you today uh, to talk about energy security and uh, the job opportunities that we have. Uh, in looking forward to the rest of the conversation today and just know that we have uh, incredible opportunities on the horizon for Colorado and the United States when it comes to our energy future. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have time to take a few questions? Yes. Okay, great. I'll just let you pick them out. Perfect. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. Just following up on your very last point on the Senate bill, um, given that you have uh, Democrat leadership in the Senate, do you think it will be harder for this bill to, um, from the, um, the new bill that you said is going to be introduced to, to make it out of the Senate than, for example, the House bill passed? Well, I, I certainly hope and believe that this bill has enough bipartisan support, particularly coming out of the House of Representatives uh, with leadership support, uh, uh, the minority whip, uh, Steny Hoyer supporting it, Steve Israel supporting it, Elliot Engel, other leaders on the Democratic side of the aisle in the House supporting the legislation. So I certainly hope that that will send a signal to Majority Leader Reid that he should move forward with this legislation and, and put politics behind us. Uh, look, this isn't about uh, whether somebody's going to uh, be a by part, by be a partisan vote or a partisan score count. Uh, what we need is to send that signal by passing this bill and do more than sending a signal, actually put legislation in place to start approving permits so that we can uh, expedite uh, the exporting. So I hope that Harry Reid will put politics aside and deal with the call that we're receiving for help from our allies. Sorry, I'm Mark Stricker, the Colorado Observer. Uh, in, during debate in the House, uh, Congressman Waxman said the problem, one problem with H.R. 6 was that the infrastructure in Europe was not there, was not going to be there by 2015, and basically the job claims were overinflated uh, by advocates such as yourself. How do you respond to that? Well, again, I think there's a theme from people who oppose production of traditional resources uh, that are looking for any kind of opportunity to oppose H.R. 6 because they know uh, that it would result in additional production of uh, natural gas. Uh, look, I think the, the infrastructure claims in the United States, the infrastructure claims in Europe uh, will be overcome uh, as a result of our investment into the approval of these permits. Uh, and remember, it's, it's a twofold uh, 
process that we're working on. Number one, obviously, is the infrastructure. Number two is the permits. But according to the testimony of Dr. Orban and others, the mere passage of the bill sends a signal, giving Ukraine and other nations leverage over Russia when it comes to energy and energy contracting. So the fact that we can pass legislation, the fact that we could get a bill signed by the president actually means something and will motivate and help, uh, help give them a greater degree of energy security than they have today. Uh, and that's, that's just the mere passage and signing of the bill into law. And so if we can get, get it signed into law, then you will see the infrastructure follow, even greater benefits uh, to follow. Tom. Uh, Tom Altmaier with Arch Cole. Uh, thank you for your leadership on many energy issues, Representative Gardner. And the, uh, I'd like you to comment on your views and your colleagues' views on the process in which LNG terminals are approved at FERC and then DOE, do you think it needs to be more expedited? Or do you think it's working okay? Uh, secondly, is any thought being given to addressing the potential impediment of uh, getting a Section 404 permit to build the export facilities? Because to get a 404 permit, you need the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to approve it, and then the Environmental Protection Agency has a right to veto that permit uh, that proposal to issue a permit. Well, to answer the first question, of course, H.R. 6 did deal with the expedited uh, permit uh, approval process and making sure that FERC completed its environmental analysis as they are supposed to do, but then they're setting a time frame, a time limit, a bookend, so to speak, on the amount of time that the Department of Energy is able to handle uh, those, uh, those permits. And so the, the FERC analysis, of course, would go forward, the environmental analysis as required, but this deals specifically with the Department of Energy part of it, making sure that they can't hold on to these and just to do nothing in, in action. Uh, so this requires there's a movement within a certain amount of days. Uh, on the second part, again, I think there are other areas of the uh, process that we'll have to work with the agencies, uh, Army Corps of Engineers with the EPA and the Department of Energy to ensure that uh, no other part ends up uh, hindering or blocking or stopping uh, our ability to get these permit facilities. Once, the, once these facilities are permitted uh, under construction and starting to ship uh, molecules of LNG. of a newly created uh, n nonprofit, my Salted Statesman Foundation. Thank you for giving us the uh, presentation that you gave. I've been, <coughs> forgive me, mm. I've been actually singing similar uh, songs for like, you know, 15 years. I, I appreciated your presentation. That said, I wanted to revisit one of the points of your presentation, particularly the intersection between economics, energy, and national security. Specifically, I want to know what your thoughts are on the impact of revolution disruptive technologies that you mentioned uh, on the attractiveness of unconventional sources of oils and gas, and what plans we have to insulate those technologies from, say, predatory trade practices by our adversaries, uh, you know, and the role of CFIS. Right now, you actually have a member of the Russian embassy that deals with economic analysis sitting three rows behind me. I mean, I would contend there's a reason why that person's here. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, what plans do we have to ensure that, that you know, you don't have uh, an adversarial actor go, well, you know, that technology is really uh, important for United States energy security and they're going to leverage that against this state, so they're going to try and use a state-run enterprise to purchase that. Well, I, I think, uh, again, we have to make sure that we protect our, our technology from a proprietary standpoint and our IP uh, work that we do and, and make sure that uh, any kind of attempts to uh, sort of monopolize a technology and therefore take it out of the, the production line or the production system, uh, that, that it, you know, we look at those and is prevented that the various agencies have responsibility for doing so. Uh, I do think you bring up an interesting point that is facing Colorado right now. Uh, and that deals with the issue of banning uh, certain types of energy production. In Colorado, uh, the real possibility of placing on the November ballot, uh, we'll know by August 4th if it goes forward or not, uh, a ban on hydraulic fracturing, a ban on energy production. Uh, and so if that goes into place, just looking at Colorado, uh, we would lose uh, thousands of jobs, uh, billions of dollars in economic activity, and a billion dollars worth of tax revenue that goes to building local roads and local schools. Uh, and uh, if that were to happen just in Colorado, uh, if it could spread to other states, then we would see a tremendous drop in energy production. Uh, and that, to me, poses a, as equal a, a greater risk right now because that is before the voters of at least uh, Colorado and before the voters of this country and in the near future if we don't uh, change the debate and make sure people understand the importance uh, of both job creation and security of our energy production. I hope you didn't think I was anti 
No, 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 I understand that. Yeah, but I'm just saying, yeah, no, no, I understand that. I'm just saying that if we don't address the issues that some people are pushing, uh, including members of Congress, uh, then we will, we will risk and threaten uh, domestically our ability to export and provide our allies with help. Yes, sir. Uh, Ralph Winnie with the Eurasia Center. How do you propose to work with China as an energy partner given their recent agreement uh, with the Russians? Well, look, I think if we open up our opportunities for permitting, if we open up our opportunities for trade and increase our trade, whether it's coal, whether it's natural gas, uh, other energy opportunities, look, uh, I think that by the global market, the nature of the global market, we will be working in, in partnership because we will be a competitor. And, and uh, as we can compete, as we enter into contracts with other nation, nations, uh, you'll see that working relationship grow. So it is an opportunity, I think, to encourage further participation in the global market with China and other trade partners. Hi, Lauren Gardner from CQ Roll Call. Back to the point you made about uh, Democratic votes for HR6 yeah. and some of them coming from areas with localized bans on fracking. Can you elaborate more on what you think that says about Democratic views vis-a-vis -vis yeah. the, the localized opposition versus the broader writ large view of right. energy production in this country? So I think it shows a, a clear understanding of the global implications of our energy revolution that the fact that we're able to achieve North American energy security, very close to doing so, the fact that we can produce uh, natural gas to the point where we can export uh, LNG, uh, I think shows an understanding from them that that can have a significant impact on global security. That can have a significant impact on our foreign policy and what happens when we turn around and end up entering conflicts that may be over energy, but we can now produce energy here so much to the point that we can ship it to other countries and prevent conflict over there. And so, so I believe that when you have somebody who has come from a state or perhaps expressed opinions against certain types of energy development, vote for a bill that they clearly know can only function if you allow energy development to move forward through technologies like uh, horizontal drilling and, uh, and hydraulic fracturing, then they're saying that the global security is far more important than any kind of a, a local a fight over an issue that we simply, uh, simply can't control at the local level, uh, but uh, have to work for as a global opportunity. Got time for one more? Right here in the front. Middle. morning. Uh, I'm Jim Beggs. Um, my question is a little bit tangential, but you've mentioned, you know, the forces that are trying to impose bans on hydraulic fracturing. Um, the question's tangential in the sense that this is an environmental question, but is there dialogue between, you know, the export, which we're, essentially what we're trying to do is, in, is dramatically increase our productivity and production over time. Recent GAO report suggests that uh, oversight agencies at Bureau of Land Management, so they're under capacity for their oversight requirements um, and, uh, and their ability to coordinate effectively with state governments like Colorado uh, needs a lot of work. And so in order to provide some confidence to the forces that are, that are opposing you right now, that we're able to ensure that we've got a, an environmentally effective uh, industry, um, can you comment on, on what we're doing there to try and improve capacity and inefficiency of these, of these oversights regimes so we can in bring more confidence to the states and the local governments that, that it is safe and is effective. Well, if you go back into some of the Colorado debates over regulation through the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, uh, some of these are right around the year 2007 when there was a major rewrite of the, the rules. There were a lot of conversations had about, is it, do we need more rules and regulations in place? Do we need more enforcement in place? And I think that there has to be a, a, a balance between finding those regulations that are actually working uh, along with the oversight and the regulators who can enforce them. Uh, I don't think there's any pushback from people who want to make sure that the rules are enforced. And that clearly is something that, that we need to pursue and do. So those conversations between BLM and states on enforcing the rules, between the states and BLM on enforcing the rules where there's public jurisdiction, public land jurisdiction overlapping with state jurisdiction, that's something that we ought to focus on and making sure that they have a partnership that can actually accomplish the goals of uh, the regulations that are in place to pr provide protection for our environment. So if you have specific ideas, look forward to, to talking to you more about them. But we do need to make sure that uh, the rules are, are adhered to and make sure that they are common sense and responsible rules. But I will say this, a gentleman by the name of Matthew Stanislaus, uh, at the time a uh, undersecretary or deputy administrator of the EPA, 
I testified before the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, several years ago. And it was about the issue of regulations. And it was particularly uh, pertinent, I think it was on a, the coal ash rule uh, that he was there testifying on. And we talked about the regulatory reach of the EPA. We talked about the regulatory uh, impacts on job creation. And it was clear that the EPA, at least in this testimony, had not done a jobs analysis, an analysis on the impact that, that rule would have on the direct job impact. And so as we talk about regulations, as we talk about enforcement, it is absolutely vital and critical that Congress make sure that it understands the impact uh, that the rule of regulation is having on job and job creation activities, both indirectly and directly. Uh, so that's part of the equation that can't be left out of it as well. So I want to thank again Heritage Action for the opportunity, Heritage uh, and the Heritage organizations for being here today and allowing me the opportunity to come and visit. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Could I uh, invite the panelists to join me on stage, please? So we wanted this event not just to be about LNG exports and natural gas exports, but really about the concept of energy-free trade. Uh, and I'm really happy that we have this pa panel of experts with us uh, to really hit on all the bases here. Um, so I'll quickly introduce them and, uh, in the interest of time, uh, get right to it. Uh, to my immediate left is Jamie Webster, who serves as the director of IHS Energy, where he analyzes short-term crude markets and studies issues related to growth of U.S. production and its potential impacts on global markets. Mr. Webster also examines global energy security as it relates to changes in energy flows. His team provides guidance to companies and governments on the impacts of above-ground energy and market risks within the markets and country strategies practice. Before his work at IHS, Mr. Webster led PFC Energy's Market Intelligence Service as a senior director. In the middle is Ross Eisenberg, who is the Vice President of Energy and Resources Policy at the National Association of Manufacturers, the largest industrial trade organization in the United States. He works on an array of issues ranging from energy production to climate change and energy efficiency. Previously, Mr. Eisenberg spent five years as an Environmental and Energy Counsel at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he was also the executive for the Chamber's Environment and Energy Committee. Scott Lincecum, on the end, is an international trade attorney who has appeared before the United States Department of Commerce, the U.S. International Trade Condition Commission, and the U.S. Court of International Trade, the European Commission, and the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement body. He has also advised clients on U.S. bilateral and regional trade agreements and U.S. trade policy, as well as WTO matters. Mr. Lincecum is a visiting lecturer at Duke University, where he teaches U.S. trade policy and politics. And we'll start with Jamie. Yeah. Okay. Are my slides up? Or coming up? Or, or is there something else I need to hit? Uh oh. oh there we go. Okay. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Heritage, and uh, and everyone for having me today. And I appreciate everybody's attention on this uh, lovely summer day. Uh, I uh, am one of the co-authors of the IHS uh, crude export study that came out, I guess, now close to a month and a half ago uh, or so. And it is, uh, uh, has received a, a, lot of, a lot of press and a lot of attention. I would urge all of you to, uh, to take a look at that. Um, uh, what I want to talk with you today is some of the stuff that we have pulled out of that study, and then we'll be happy to take questions after we uh, get through the whole panel. Um, some, uh, raising uh, uh, some of the points made earlier is that U.S. production growth has been absolutely incredible. And I think a lot of people really miss just how amazing it is. So this is our, uh, both our uh, uh, past uh, production uh, growth as well as our, our forecast. And I want to keep in, keep in your mind is that this is our production forecast. This is not future facts. So there's actually, this actually assumes that we are uh, that we end up allowing crude oil exports. If you don't allow crude oil exports, we actually see that the production growth will be uh, quite a bit lower. Uh, last year, we had production growth that was just over a million barrels a day. And to put that in context, that is the fastest growth that any country at any point in the history of the oil markets has ever had, with the exception of Saudi Arabia several decades ago when they were finally deciding to bring their their production back. It's, it's an incredible amount, and it has allowed us to offset a lot of the outages that we have both imposed and that we have seen on Libya, Iran, and other places. This production growth has also already had major benefits for us in changing our trade relationships. Petroleum product exports are now the most valuable export that the United States 
uh, has. And it has changed our, our trade relationships with key countries, key oil producing countries such as Nigeria. A couple of years ago, we were receiving about 1.1 million barrels a day of oil out of Nigeria. And for those of you that pay attention to oil markets, when you saw the high prices in August of 2008 reaching $147, Nigeria and the issues there were actually one of the key factors on why we went to that high of a price. We now receive oil from Nigeria that is a mere trickle, and we actually are now providing up to 60% of Nigeria's refined products. Uh, so the, ch the re trade relationship has changed dramatically. This has also changed things dramatically here in the United States, as uh, Representative Gardner uh, mentioned as well, which is that you're seeing an amazing amount of job growth and new businesses being created. And while the New York Times came out a couple of weeks ago uh, and wrote a, uh, a story uh, talking about uh, kids that were getting out of high school and taking these fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar a year jobs, and wasn't it terrible that they were missing uh, college? Uh, as someone that couldn't get into an elite college if my life depended upon it, I'm perfectly fine that they are that they are doing that, and I think it's I think it's absolutely a fantastic opportunity uh, for us and for us to provide the sort of jobs that help not just people that are able to get into the elite schools, but <laughs> but a broader sort of uh, a group of Americans. Uh, finally, this has allowed us to create what I would term a U.S. laboratory. So this has allowed us to create a lot of new techniques and tactics and ways to use unconventional productions, production techniques, not just in the unconventional place, but also in conventional place, meaning that this can then, this laboratory and the techniques there can now be used and will be used in the future on an international basis, helping us to, and the world to create more and more energy. And it's, as I often say, which is that a barrel of oil produced anywhere increases energy security everywhere. And I think as people start to redevelop their views on energy security, they will really start to move, uh, to, move to that point. So again, this is our production growth. And you can see that you've got two different production lines. Um, and I want to highlight that all of that great stuff that I'm talking about is actually at risk if you don't allow crude oil exports. And that is because, as I'll get into it, is that we have a real mismatch and a real disconnect between the type of crude that we are producing, which is world-class crude, going into a refining system that is also world-class. And while it sounds like those two should match up perfectly, they actually don't. You actually want world-class crude to go into less high-quality refineries, and you want world-class refineries to be able to take in lower-quality crude, heavier, more sour uh, sort of crude. And you can see our, our production case in terms of the uh, potential production. That really kind of highlights the fact that U.S. production, for many of us, including my own company, we've had a difficult time trying to figure out just how fast this thing is going to grow. It's been absolutely incredible, and it continues to move there. But we are starting to move to a point where it's a problem. And uh, a number of, of refiners and other organizations are saying that the day of reckoning will soon be coming. My argument is that the day of reckoning is actually already here that this is already causing problems today. In the fourth quarter last year, you finally saw a disconnect, not just of WTI, which was previously a bottleneck location uh, in, uh, in Oklahoma, but you're actually seeing, you saw a disconnect at the Gulf Coast and pretty much any crude in, uh, in the US, where instead of being the crude being bottlenecked in, in Cushing, it actually went to the water's edge and it couldn't go any further. And so you started to see these substantial discounts. So when you hear refineries say that we can definitely take all of this light tide oil, I don't dispute that at all. They absolutely can, but at significant price discounts. And I want to highlight, and I'll get into this in a bit, is that these price discounts are not flowing back to consumers. So comparing it on natural gas uh, versus oil, we have had substantial production growth in both natural gas and oil. We import and continue, will continue to import both natural gas and oil. Consumers have saved a large amount of money on lower natural gas prices, both for heating and for electricity. They have not saved anything in terms of gasoline. Additionally, we are now going to allow LNG exports and natural gas exports, but we are not allowing oil exports. And this is in a dynamic because the natural, natural gas is a regional fuel. 
you will actually see prices for natural gas go up slightly, which I would say is just fine because we're going to have greater economic impact from that. If you export oil, gasoline prices are actually going to go down, which is difficult for people to, to understand why that is the case. Finally, the reason why we are allowing natural gas exports but not gasoline exports is because when you receive your bill for natural gas and electricity, it's in a pile of other bills and it's once a month. Gasoline is a price you see every day and everybody pays attention to it. And that's why it's really much more of a political issue rather than an issue in terms of the pure economics. Because on a pure economic basis, it actually makes more sense to export oil than arguably it does LNG, although I will argue that you should still export LNG, just so, mm -hmm. we're, just so we're clear here. So this discount that you saw in the fourth quarter is going to happen again in the fourth quarter this year. This time it is going to be deeper, it is going to be wider, it's going to, it's going to really impact the industry in, in our view, and this is going to start to slow down investment in the upstream, which is really the growth area for all of this. Um, going forward. And the reason why we're seeing this, and I know this is a complicated graph for those of you who aren't downstream refining engineers, of which I am also not one because I can't get into that school either, is uh, let me just walk you through and why the discounts go from just a little bit and suddenly they get really, really wide. So when we started to have this U.S. production growth, the first thing we did is we started backing out light, sweet crude. So the Nigerian example that I gave earlier, we didn't need their crude anymore. They would instead use it uh, for here. So those refiners, which we call the tier one refiners, only needed a discount of around 50 cents to a dollar. Once that was complete, you moved to what we call the tier two refineries. The tier two refineries are, are refineries that really like to prefer medium sour crude, and so there's a slightly different quality for them, so they have to make a couple of changes. So you only need a dollar or so, a dollar or two discount relative to, uh, to prices, global prices, in order to take that on. <laughs> tier three and tier four is where it starts to get ugly for the upstream. Tier three is where you've got enough capacity in terms of uh, being able to make naphtha. And for those of you who don't know, naphtha is actually a key uh, feedstock for making gasoline. So what ends up happening is these refineries can make enough naphtha, but they can't make gasoline. And naphtha, as you can probably guess, is not worth as much as gasoline. And so these refiners need a little bit more discount so that they can make themselves uh, whole. And so that's where you start to get a 2 to $4 barrel. Finally, tier four are what we call the rock crushers which are, these are refineries that are the highest quality, can take the most complex and well-invested refineries in the world. And these refineries are designed for taking just the nastiest crude that you can possibly get. So when you bring them what is essentially champagne crude, they will essentially have to reduce the capacity of their uh, refinery. So instead of producing, say, 200,000 barrels a day of refined product, they'll only be able to, to produce 170,000 barrels a day of refined product. That will actually cause them so that they will need quite a bit of a discount in order to take that online. So that's when you start to see discounts of, as you can see, uh, up to $18. And I want to emphasize the plus there. You can end up getting into a, a point where you can get $25, $30. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to close this out now. I'm a consultant. I can speak for three days, so I have to, <laughs> I have to get myself right. So we've had a couple of, a couple of movements lately, which is that one, uh, the BIS, and I know some of my fellow panelists will touch on this, so I'll, I'll just hit it briefly, is that you've had uh, condensate uh, private letter rulings issued for two companies. There's still a discussion on how big this is going to be and what the impacts are. Uh, the points that I want to make on this is that even if the... U.S. allows condensate exports, this is very much an incomplete solution. This doesn't actually allow you to get uh, a lot of the crude out of the Bakken and other locations. It's really, it really hits largely the Eagle Fort. It also, when doing these sorts of kind of circumscribed uh, uh, solutions, you can end up having inadvertent policy mistakes where companies could then end up having to spend a lot of money just to get around or trying to get into some sort of loophole so that they can access uh, global, uh, global crude prices. So I would just encourage the administration and Congress that, you know, if, you know, when you, when you look at the policy, it's much better to have a nice, clear, sharp policy. Uh, finally, uh, I, I'll, I've touched briefly on the gasoline price, but this is why gasoline prices will actually go down. So gasoline prices are actually a global commodity. They are set on a global basis. And so our gasoline prices, even if our oil prices go down, uh, we will continue to get internationally priced gasoline. That is not going to change. The way we can actually impact the price is actually to continue 
to produce here in the United States and eventually allow it to export. And the reason we need to be able to export it is not so that it actually gets into the global system. We're already impacting the global system by backing out our imports. It allows the production growth to continue. That's the key. And so allowing that production growth to continue actually increases global supply, and that ends up bringing gasoline prices down slightly. It's not a huge savings, but it does bring it down slightly. The real impact is actually on the broader economy. Now, one of the questions I often get, and I, I go to all of the OPEC meetings, is, is Jamie, well, why don't, won't OPEC just reduce production to make, to make up for this? Yes, they absolutely will. But that's not a bad thing. That actually means that as Saudi decreases their production, one, they're going to be receiving less funds for those that care about that. And two, it increases their spare capacity, which means that the world has a bit more uh, shock absorbers to be able to handle any sort of outage from, say, Iran, Iraq, and other sorts of, other sorts of places. Finally, this has really impacted everywhere in the United States. Even those states that can't stand hydraulic fracturing, despite their protests, they are actually getting jobs out of this. Uh, and so it's really important to understand that this is a very broad-based um, sort of uh, uh, growth. There is, There would be some advantages in terms of the refining system if you didn't allow exports. Our, our, in our base case, our view is that over the next 20 years, you would see $5 billion of investment in the downstream if you don't allow crude exports. That's, that's a lot of money. $5 billion is a lot. If you do allow exports, you would have an investment of $967 billion, which, in my math, that's actually more. Uh, and so you actually would have, and it is a much broader-based sort of growth. So I will go ahead and, uh, and leave it at that, but thank you very much for your time. Sure, let me see what I got to do to make this thing work. Are we good? All right. I'm going to go on up there, too. So um, thank you for having me, Nick. Really appreciate it. Uh, love the opportunity to come over here and talk with you guys. Um, and uh, and this is an issue that uh, that we've talked a lot about, so I'm happy to, to have an audience for it um, uh, over at the Heritage Foundation. Um, my name is Ross Eisenberg. I run the Energy Policy uh, Division at the uh, at the National Association of Manufacturers. Very quickly, with us, our job uh, we're lobbyists. We our job is to uh, make the United States the best place in the world to manufacture. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not, um, and a lot of and that is due to policies. Um, energy tends to be one that that we actually have a competitive advantage. Um, and so, uh, so we have a lot of good things to say, uh, but policies matter, and and that's why I'm here, and and that's what I'm here to talk about. So uh, to back up a little bit, uh, we, were, we were founded in 1895. Uh, we were founded specifically for the purpose of free trade. Manufacturers were looking to open up new markets overseas. Um, that's why we exist. That's why the NAM is here. So um, it, the principle of free trade and, and, and open markets pretty much pervades all of our policies, including the ones on energy exports. Um, we do have uh, policies on, on these topics. Um, so this is, in a nutshell, where we stand. Um, we view the issue pretty holistically. We support, we fundamentally support free trade and open markets, and we oppose market storing barriers to trade. Sounds probably a lot like a lot of the things that they're saying in this building. Uh, it is where we stand. It's where we've always stood on these issues. We kind of look at it as you're either for free trade or you're not, and we are. Um, so that's that's our stance on all of the energy export uh, issues, and um, uh, has sort of been dictating our um, involvement on a lot of these. Um, and part of that is because we're part of the, the, the manufacturing supply chain for these exports. It's not just about exporting the fuel. Um, you need cement. You need iron and steel. You need to manufacture a lot of the valves and the, the compressors and the things that go into these projects that are humongous. I mean, each LNG export project is a $10 billion project. The supply chain for that is enormous. Um, it, it really involves sectors of my own membership that I didn't even know we're part of this. Um, same thing goes for coal exports. Same thing goes for some of the clean energy technologies. So many companies do this, and so many companies do this here, that, um, that it's been a real opportunity for us. And so it's why the NAM is engaged. It isn't just about the fuel. It's about all those other opportunities across the supply chain, across the value chain, to create jobs uh, for manufacturing in the US and allow us to make a comeback. So um, the challenge is policies do unfortunately matter, and we've got a lot of them that are that are providing, you know, that 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 set up barriers in some way, shape, or form to exporting kind of everything uh, in the energy space. And um, and this really is, I mean, I've got members that have come in and 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 asked me to, you know, talk about every single one of these issues. Um, they, a lot of them tend to be regulatory barriers. 
Um, so I'm going to start with Cole. Um, Cole's the one we haven't really talked uh, much about today, so I'm going to try to fill that gap. Um, coal exports, uh, we actually export a fair amount of coal already. Uh, it's been exported over the years from about uh, 20 different states. Um, it's something we do, and depending on how much domestic use is, we either export more of it or less of it. We are now exporting a lot more of it. Uh, that is partly due to policies and market conditions that are that are either forcing switching to gas or inst or, or gas is just kind of happening. Uh, and um, and so we're using less coal domestically, which is creating new opportunities overseas. Global coal demand is surging tremendously. Um, hundreds of of, of 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 gigawatts of new coal capacity are expected overseas uh, in places like China and Southeast Asia and, and Australia, places like that, uh, and South Africa and Africa and places of, of that nature. As in, as countries are industrializing, they're using everything, and one of those things is coal, and we happen to have a, a heck of a lot of it. So um, right now, we are actually trying to build uh, three new uh, ports. Actually, we're not trying to build them. We're trying to expand them to accommodate the larger Panamax ships um, that'll be built, uh, that'll be in play once the Panama Canal is finished, out of three different ports in uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, two of them in Washington State and one of them in Oregon. Um, challenge in this is that if you had to pick two places to export coal from that weren't California, and those would be the two last on your list, right? I mean, you know, they, they are not places that are terribly friendly to coal. They're both pretty much eliminating all of their coal-fired generation at this point. Um, and, and, the, and there has been very strong sentiment um, from the top levels of those two governments uh, that they don't necessarily want these things here, which is a real problem because a lot of the people actually want them there. Uh, a lot of the, the union workers, a lot of the folks that would actually build and operate these ports would like to have some of these jobs, which are good-paying jobs. And at the end of the day, a lot of these terminals are going to be you know, transporting some things other than coal. Um, they're bulk commodity terminals, so grains will go through there and things like that. A lot of it will be coal, but a, a fair amount of it won't. So the barrier there has actually become uh, the environmental review, pr review process. Uh, environmental groups seeking to just kind of get at coal any, any chance they get have successfully, in a lot of ways, lobbied the state governments to say, okay, this would be a wonderful time to not just look at the environmental impact of the project, but look at the environmental impact of the whole supply chain. So when it's being mined in the Powder River Basin, when it's being transported by train, when it's being shipped overseas, and ultimately when it's being burned. That's a tremendous, tremendous analysis to do. Uh, I don't know that we could even do it. Um, they lobbied pretty hard at the federal government level to do it. The Army Corps basically said, no, we're not going to do that because we don't necessarily have the expertise to do that. Um, but the states are taking it on. The, the goal here really is, it's, it's to, to make it a verb, the keystoning of this project, right? It is to, is to foul this up with as much delay as possible to make it not happen um, and just wait it out till environment, environmental conditions change. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that's used against all energy projects, whether they're renewables or coal or, or, or anything like that, but it's the strategy here. The problem is that the governments of those two states have actually, um, have actually kind of gone there. Um, the, uh, there's actually legislation also in, um, in Oregon that is being pushed as kind of a model legislation to expand NEPA out in this manner. Why is that a problem? It's a problem, number one, because it's, it's a problem for these projects, but it's also a problem because, and again, which gets us involved as manufacturers, uh, it means that, um, that, that, that you've set a very, very bad, bad precedent for the export of just about everything else. If you're starting to look at the life cycle environmental impact of a thing that you export, we export a whole lot of things that have a life cycle environmental impact. Um, whether it's in the agricultural sector or in the finished product sector, whether it's cars or I mean, we export everything. That if you start looking at that under those broad bands, uh, you got a real problem, and you're making it that much harder to export. So, you know, one chip may fall here that may get them a short-term victory on coal that creates a lot of bad precedent that can be used against basically anything else we don't want to export for a long time. So we've got a real problem with that. Um, and, and, and frankly, it actually cascades to some of the other fuels issues. When this was going down with the federal government in the Pacific Northwest, um, it was also the same arguments were being used uh, for natural gas. Um, folks that were challenging the Cove Point Terminal and some other places said, you know what, this would be a wonderful time to examine upstream hydraulic fracturing impacts in the context of exporting natural gas. Again, same goal here, trying to slow the process down. Um, so. Obviously, we've heard a lot about natural gas. We just want the up and down decision to come quicker. Um, that's that's kind of our position on this. Let the market work. We're not telling them that they have to say yes. We're not telling them that they should say no. We're just telling them they have to say something. 
And, um, and at the end of the day, we just want it to go faster. Uh, DOE changed their procedures on that recently. We commented on it with basically that statement, just make it go faster. Give, us, give these guys a decision one way or the other so that they can actually move on and make their investment decisions or not make their investment decisions. Um, same thing goes with basically everything else. In the nuclear industry, you don't hear a lot about it, but obviously since we're not building a lot of new nuclear facilities here, there are tremendous opportunities for them overseas as well. There are onerous requirements that are, that are a patchwork of different problems at the DOE, at Commerce, at other places to do this. And then lastly, and I, I don't want to incite a riot or anything, but at the end of the day, um, you know, in, in the energy technology space, in the sort of the boiler manufacturing space and things like this, we make some of these things too. Uh, we want to be able to export those things too. It's, um, it's, it's one of the reasons why my organization is for the Exim Bank. Um, and again, not trying to decide a riot, I'm not even the Exim Bank guy at my organization. But, um, but it is one of the reasons for it because typically when they're bidding on those against other countries uh, and losing on those, you have to check a box that basically says, do you have ex export credit financing? And, and if we can't check the box, we don't have it. So it's one of those reasons that we're for that. Uh, I'm gonna move on. So very quickly, <laughs> the, um, uh, we did a study on this uh, in the trade context. And, and, and it's really kind of the, the, the last thing that I want to end on. We actually hired the judge of, um, of, 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 the, of the WTO, the former judge. Guy's got an encyclopedic knowledge of this. He was the guy writing the opinions for God knows how many years. Um, he's a private practice lawyer in town now, former member of Congress, I think a Democrat. Um, and we said, look, we, we know the legal arguments back and forth on either side, but let's just talk about the delay here, because really that's what the issue is. It's delay fouling up the gears on a lot of these projects. We said, okay, take a look at the delay and whether the delay is DOE sitting on these things as they're taking forever to make an, a, an, a, an application decision, a license decision on the LNG side, or whether it's the federal government or a state uh, such as Washington uh, state making, you know, just dragging this thing out with an expanded environmental review. Does that in and of itself constitute a violation of our trade obligations under the WTO? And he, the answer to both was unequivocally yes, in his opinion. So again, the guy who would be making the decision came down and said, oh, no, no, this is absolutely a, a real violation of our obligations under the WTO. Uh, we put this report out. It's up on our website. I urge you to look at it. Um, I'm happy to provide it if, if you need a copy of it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we took a look at this at the trade. It kind of comes back to where we, we, we started on a lot of these, these, uh, these energy export issues. You're either for free trade or you're not. We think if, if the delays continue in these respects, then, then we are winding up in a situation where we're not only inhibiting trade, but we're doing it in a way that actually violates some of our international agreements. And I mean, finally, the, uh, we think it's actually contrary to what the president's been saying about exports. So I'm going to read you something that, that I pulled from a, a speech he gave in New Orleans last year that I find completely fascinating. He said, consider that just a couple years from now, we're going to have new super tankers that are going to start coming through the Panama Canal, and these tankers can hold three times as much cargo as today's. If a port can't handle those super tankers, they'll go load and unload cargo somewhere else. So there's work that we can start doing in terms of dredging and making the passageways deeper, which means the super tankers can have more stuff on them, which means they can unload and load more stuff, which makes this port more competitive. So why wouldn't we put people to work upgrading them, and why wouldn't we do that? To which everybody applauded. That's all I'm saying, right? I mean, that's what my organization is saying. We're saying the exact same thing to slow down these exports or at least to slow down the opportunities that exist for exporting energy would be contrary to all of the things that we're supposed to be standing for. So uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Look forward to our, our discussion afterwards. Hi, again, my name's Scott Lincecum, um, and thanks uh, to Nick for organizing this. Um, I gotta say, it, oh, first, before I begin, a lawyerly disclaimer, leave it to the lawyer to do this. Everything I say here today is um, on my own personal capacity and has nothing to do with uh, my firm or any other organization I'm affiliated with. Uh, with that um, out of the way, um, let me just say it's great uh, to be here to see how far we've come on the energy exports issue. Um, when I first started kind of scribbling on this a few years ago, um, this was a pretty arcane issue. Nobody would really talk about it. And to now see HR6, to see a very public discussion, to see great reports like the one Jamie produced, uh, it's really, um, it's good to see. Um, unfortunately, uh, we still have a long way to go. And um, We've talked a lot already about um, some of the economic issues facing oil, gas, coal export restrictions. 
I'm going to leave that to these experts. Um, and Ross did kind of steal a little of my thunder because I was going to talk about some of the legal issues surrounding these export restrictions. Being a trade lawyer, I'm still going to do that a bit. And then I'm going to talk about some kind of broader policy issues. Um, so first, on the legal issues. Um, as Ross mentioned, uh, our export restrictions do raise pretty significant concerns under our international obligations with the World Trade Organization. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. Again, Jim Bacchus, former pellet body chair, um, said the same thing. I was very relieved to see that he agreed uh, with what I wrote. It's nice. <laughs> um, but you don't have to take our word for it either. In fact, the United States government, in a recent dispute against Chinese restrictions on uh, raw materials and rare earths exports, made the exact same argument. So the United States government itself understands that uh, restrictive export licensing systems and other types of export restrictions not only are destructive and distortive economically, but also violate our international obligations under the WTO agreements. Um, and a slight uh, uh, addition there is that we probably wouldn't qualify for all sorts of environmental or national security exceptions that these agreements provide for. And again, uh, uh, Jim Bacchus and others have, have said the same thing. Uh, the upstream issues have been well covered, but one of the things that is less covered, but I think uh, equally important, is that our export restrictions actually raise pretty significant issues for downstream exporters. And these are guys like uh, exporters of refined products, petrochemicals, manufacturers, and so forth. The reason for that is that by distorting domestic prices of upstream inputs like natural gas and crude oil, we actually expose our exporters to anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases in foreign markets. We've seen an uptick in petrochemicals and downstream cases, some against the United States and some against other exporters. It's a very tense area. So as we are flooding the market with new American exports of downstream products, we're actually at the same time exposing those products to retaliatory or remedial duties. So we'll lose all the economic benefits we could potentially get because of these export restrictions. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. The United States government, Department of Commerce, routinely imposes countervailing duties on the basis of export restrictions on upstream inputs. A little bit of hypocrisy going on here. Um, so those are some of the legal issues. Now on to the policy. Um, there really are few policy issues that are such a no-brainer as liberalizing exports of U.S. energy products. Uh, in fact, there is almost uniform think tank consensus, which you never see in Washington, on the issue of export liberalization. And the reasons are, are manifest. So we have a jobs issue. We have an investment issue. We have an exports issue, the National Export Initiative. Um, you know, as a free trader, we're always admonishing uh, politicians to not talk just about exports. Here, we actually have an export issue. We can all agree on it. And yet, we restrict and we don't liberalize exports. Really makes no sense. If you like green energy, you actually should want more exports. Let's say that the studies are correct and that the exportation of liquid natu uh, liquefied natural gas will slightly raise prices. Well, what this does, according to the Department of Energy, is will actually make green energy more competitive, more price competitive. And of course, it does it without subsidies. So here, you have a policy that if you really like solar panels and windmills, that's great. Here, you can do it without subsidizing those things. Um, another policy issue that, on the downside, is that, you know, it seems that the window for real reform might actually be closing a little bit. So there is, beyond the economic side, there is a sense of urgency. Um, we are now seeing American uh, uh, oil and gas producers uh, expending hundreds of millions of dollars to build mini refineries so that they can circumvent, for example, the crude export ban. Now, once these guys do this, um, they're not going to be as excited about lobbying for export liberalization. Um, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, this is inefficient, but it's their bottom line. So they're not sitting around just waiting for the United States to lift the ban. Um, moreover, as we see 
this political momentum can die as more uh, LNG export licenses are approved under the current distortive system, or as Jamie mentioned, little exceptions are made for crude. So we're slowly whittling away the kind of political momentum that this issue has. And then last, our trading partners will become a little less motivated as they negotiate FTAs through the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the EU-US FTA, what we call the TTIP. So practically, these little steps are better than nothing, but they're far from ideal. They're far from the sharp policy uh, that Jamie described. What we would like to ideally see is broad-based liberalization in a clear and consistent manner that produces all these jobs and all this investment and all these exports that everybody wants. So with that, I'm going to move on um, to talk about beyond our export restrictions, um, some of the other trade and energy policies out there that cause problems in the market. Um, first is the Jones Act, um, which restricts uh, U.S. interstate uh, shipping to uh, U.S. flagged and manufactured vessels. Um, this actually has uh, a pretty significant impact on domestic energy prices. Um, now, it wouldn't be as big a problem if we didn't have the next problem, which is restrictions on pipeline construction. So, of course, we have Keystone XL and other restrictions. And not only are these do these things not make a lot of economic sense from the jobs perspective uh, and just simple transport, but they also raise concerns under our international obligations. Um, the United States uh, is, is limiting the transit of Canadian oil from, uh, from Canada to the Gulf. Um, this could raise concerns under the NAFTA and the WTO. Um, next, uh, we have duties, uh, anti-dumping and countervailing duties on, uh, for example, oil country tubular goods, which is oil piping. So the United States Department of Commerce just a couple days ago announced pretty hefty duties for Korea and a bunch of other countries, thus making it more expensive for our energy producers here. Um, we already have duties in place um, on OCTG from China. Um, we also have duties in place on solar panels and windmills. Um, other countries have retaliate, retaliated with their own duties on our green energy products. Um, this is just not a very well thought out all of the above energy policy. Um, last, you can't really talk about uh, energy boondoggles without talking about ethanol and the renewable fuel standard, which also raises significant trade and economic concerns. So with that, I'm going to close um, with some broader policy thoughts. Um, you know, these things matter, energy in particular. And it's not just giant corporations. It not, it's not just NAM and the petrochemical guys and the oil producers. This affects American families. It has a real effect on bottom line. For a very simple example, eliminating the crude oil restrictions and the Jones Act by themselves would, according to a lot of studies, reduce the price of a gallon of gas by about 20 cents a gallon. And that doesn't mean a lot, 20 cents, right? But it adds up over the year, particularly for struggling American families just trying to get by and buy groceries and things. Now, speaking of groceries, our energy policies have uh, knock-on effects. So energy policies affect food prices. They affect transportation prices, construction prices. So as we artificially and ridiculously inflate energy prices, we're also hurting downstream products that, again, really impact the American family's bottom line. And of course, this is a regressive tax on American families. This hurts poor American families much more than, than rich ones. Um, it really makes little sense. Um, Another broader policy concern is, you know, the, a lot of these policies just reek of cronyism and special treatment. So again, going back to the export restrictions, American families, you and me, we pay more at the pump so a few refiners in the Midwest and the Rocky Mountains can make a ton of cash on export markets by getting cheap West Texas intermediate crude and then exporting it for a major advantage on international markets. This just doesn't make a lot of moral sense. Um, and it's a very good reason for us to consider eliminating 
these policies. Um, and then finally, um, as I mentioned, I alluded to, there is a ton of policy hypocrisy here. You know, how can the United States be its maintain its long-standing position as kind of the international trade, free trade stalwart, um, and the supporter of free markets when we pursue these types of policies at home. For example, the United States government just recently told the Europeans that they would not consider reforming our energy export restrictions as part of our FTA negotiations. Meanwhile, we're telling China to reform their export restrictions on rare earths. This type of hypocrisy not only is just, uh, not only does it look bad, but it also undermines our efforts to seek a better global market. Um, and in that sense, you know, it really does uh, under, and trust me, it undermines these negotiations, it undermines our credibility. Um, so with that, um, I, I thank you for having me and, and would love to take some questions. Well, thank you all for that. We'll open it up to questions. If you could please wait for the microphone so the people uh, watching online can hear you. Uh, I'm going to start right back there. Hi, this is a uh, question for Scott. Yep. Uh, Scott, I'm Tom Altmar. I'm with Arch Coal Company. Uh, just for those in the room, for those unfamiliar, last year we exported 117 million tons of coal to 46 different countries. It is a major export commodity for the United States. Uh, right now, Scott, uh, Japan and Indonesia, not Japan, Japan and Korea would very much like to get higher quality Wyoming coal so they could displace more worst polluting Indonesian coal. Right. Uh, could Korea or Japan bring an action before the WTO with respect to the slow walking the state of Washington is doing on building new coal export capacity on the West Coast? Um, so, again, legal disclaimer, you know, just my personal opinion. Um, and sorry, we lawyers have a very bad habit of doing that. Um, there certainly are grounds. Um, uh, again, you know, the, the report that NAM put out uh, indicates that these types of restrictions, even if it's just a simple delay, uh, violate longstanding WTO dispute settlement practice. Um, and given that, there, you know, we have environmental exceptions in the WTO agreements and we have exception for national security, but really the specific text of those uh, exceptions really doesn't apply in the case of any of these energy exports. So I would say yes, um, they very likely have a good case. Um, they could in some ways follow uh, the, uh, the submissions that the United States itself put together when it was challenging China's export restrictions. Um, the question always is whether they diplomatically would pursue such an option, but that really kind of obscures the fact that it, they nevertheless um, have this at their disposal, which of course makes um, investment options a little murkier, negotiations a little more difficult. Sure. Bottom left. Thank you. Brian Riley from Heritage. I wondered if any of you had any comments on what President Obama or a future president uh, administratively could do to make some of these reforms or do they require uh, legislative action? Thank you. So, um, you know, each one's a little bit different. Um, you know, certainly in the LNG context, like I said, just go faster, right? I mean, it's pretty simple from our perspective. Uh, you know, they, they, it's a very long permitting process to get an LNG uh, pro project built. What was fouling up the gears was literally step one. I mean, it was a conditional approval that you had to get from DOE before you could really even get deep into the FERC process to, to start investing the hundreds of, of, of millions of dollars that you'd have to do to get the environmental review done and all that kind of stuff. This is step one for a years-long process. There was really no reason why it should have been taking so long. I mean, first they had a moratorium, then they were waiting two to three to four months in between processing individual applications. They were kind of, they had a haphazard way of doing it. Um, just move faster, right? I mean, like, just kind of do it. Um, so I think that's, that's something any any president could do by a pretty clear directive. Hey, guys, get this thing done. Um, in the coal space, um, you know, they, they actually came down to the right spot at the Army Corps 
Obviously, there are others in the administration that are not thrilled about that. This is an area that I think is um, it's one of those lurking legal issues that is going to be a real problem over time. Um, you know, they did look at the life cycle of environmental impact on Keystone, of the fuel being transported. Um, they, they are doing that in other contexts. Um, EPA, where it has a little bit more sway, is pushing where it can to get that kind of thing done. This is kind of the next horizon for the sort of anti-energy um, movement. Um, which is, hey, let's just broaden this sucker, the review, as long as we can so that the procedure takes forever and nobody can ever say that they're at fault. Um, that's a real problem. I mean, it's a real problem. And I think some clear guidelines, uh, maybe the other way out of the administration, would, would be quite nice. I mean, they, they actually intended to do this a couple years ago when they, when they were going to apply NEPA to climate change. Um, they haven't finalized that guidance, but they're there. I mean, in practice, they're there. That's a real problem and it's something that I strongly urge them to, to, to go the other way on. Uh, you can't fight climate change on a permit by permit basis, right? You need to have the broader policy. So, anyway, uh, on the uh, oil side, uh, the, uh, the the quick way to do it is actually with a uh, natural uh, national interest finding that the president could do, which uh, has been uh, done in the past. I mean, the reason why we have a crude oil export ban was actually because of the price controls we had many decades ago, and the idea was, well, we don't want people to just export this; that would kind of ruin the whole price control plan. Um, and so there was actually a, a, a finding by President Reagan that allowed petroleum product exports, but he did not touch crude oil exports because of issues about actually uh, Japan and, and Alaskan crude at the time. Uh, later on, President Clinton found a, had a similar finding and uh, allowed West Coast crude to, uh, to go to Asia. So it's actually a, you know, we could, we could be done by the end of the day. So. <laughs> you okay? Uh, Amy Harder with the Wall Street Journal. Um, I have a question on oil exports. Um, so say for a few, um, most Republicans in Congress are pretty um, wary and not too eager to support exporting crude oil. For example, Representative Gardner didn't talk about it at all, and when I asked him about it outside in the hallway, he wasn't um, too chatty about it. Um, so why do you think Republicans, who are you know very supportive of LNG exports, are wary about this? And what are you trying to do, if anything, to change this perception? And I guess this is a question for anybody who can so answer. I'll, I'll start. Um, the, the simple answer is uh, gas prices. Um, that for, and, and just political history, you know, for almost 40 years, um, the American public has had energy independence and really energy autarky beaten into our heads by politicians and journalists and others. And this has created a, a real uh, concern um, among the public about exporting, and I and I've seen it when I when I talk to folks um, about it, there is an immediate suspicion to exporting crude oil because they think it's going to raise gas prices. So for Republican and Democratic politicians alike, uh, the fear is quite simple: you're going to make headlines by liberalizing crude exports. The next thing you know, there's going to be some totally unrelated shock to global supply that's going to cause gas prices to go up, and next thing you know, your phones are going to be ringing off the hook from angry constituents. How you change that, personally, I think is through reports like the one Jamie put out and others. Um, and politicians need to get their heads around the idea that um, exports lower gas prices. It's really that easy. Um, but that takes time. Um, you know, we've had the LNG problem for years now, and we're just seeing HR6 move. And I said, you know, it's a good thing, but it takes time. Uh, and, and to add on to that, I mean, I think politically there's actually very little upside, you know, to, to follow on. There's very little upside for politicians at this particular moment precisely for uh, uh, the reason Scott mentioned, which is that you could have some totally unrelated event the day after you say we're going to allow the export of crude, and then everybody... Uh, gets up in arms. The reality is that you know ESR reports, I think, help, but also I think uh, uh, politicians and consumers need to better understand the advantages and the advantages that go away when this starts to uh, become a problem. So I think this fourth quarter is actually going to be um, a, a big deal in uh, in in helping that. So I think that's uh, that that's where we that's where we end up getting into a, a potential change. I would also add, I think there's a bit of a national security argument that plays into this with some Republicans, too, um, which I think is nonsensical. I mean, if you look at it, uh, opening up opportunities for exports will actually bolster national security by increasing our production growth, giving us more if we, have, if we need it, 
uh, and also reducing any other country's ability to use energy as leverage in the future. So I think the national security arguments, the price concerns arguments, the energy independence arguments that uh, Scott hit on are, are absolutely spot on, and, and uh, these arguments for those things are nonsensical. Uh, one last thing to add. The other is uh, that there is a long-standing tradition of, of news organizations and, and others to talk about the WTI price, and the reality is that the WTI price for most Americans, that's kind of how they, you know, when they're not looking at the gasoline price, how they kind of view if gasoline prices are going up and down. The reality is that that is a worthless price to look at. Uh, it really should be, you know, they should really be focusing on Brent, but there's just a, you know, for decades, uh, uh, you know, TV organizations, you always see it on the crawl there, but for most Americans, it really doesn't matter what the WTI price is for, at least for their gasoline. Anybody else? I'm J Jim Beggs. Um, my question is, a, there was a CFIUS question asked a while ago on, on exporting the technology, and I guess, is, is there any in, in your background uh, that you've studied, is there a demand amongst some of the friendly nations for us to export some of the new technologies that we've developed so they can exploit their own natural gas? And what's the, what are the current policies or the thoughts on, on allowing us? Because what I've read is that 90% of the unconventional wells that are being developed are in the United States. So I'm, I'm assuming there's a significant uh, technological advantage. What's the state and policy that we would consider exporting some of those technology to allow some friendly nations to start um, exploiting their, their natural gas resources and oil? Um, I'll, I'll actually I'll touch oil real quick, which I think which I think is actually uh, quite similar. One, we do have an advantage in terms of the technology, but there's a lot of other advantages in the U.S. on why we had it. So it's, you know, resource quality and quantity. It's also the vast infrastructure network that we have. It's the ability to get financing. It's the innovation and competitive nature that we have. So there's actually a lot of above ground issues that a lot of countries need to figure out how they're going to do it. And our view is, you know, very much while the U.S. was the first, much as China kind of figured out how to do capitalism and its own sort of brand, we think each of these countries will eventually figure that out uh, as well. From our standpoint, you know, allowing this to go internationally, as I said, uh, a barrel of oil anywhere increases energy security uh, everywhere. And so I think for, for us, our numbers show with our base case is that within 10 to 15 years, you'll actually get about 10% of uh, light tide oil from unconventional out of, you know, non-North uh, non America uh, sources. And so I think it's, a, it's an important step for us to continue to to allow that, and it gives opportunities for our companies uh, to, you know, to kind of showcase uh, these technologies. And so, two more points um, on the gas side. Uh, you may recall after um, the Ukraine situation first started, um, the uh, administration actually did come out and say that they were very much in support of exporting these technologies, particularly to allies in Eastern Europe. Um, the Department of State issued a. Uh, uh, press release or something saying that they actually have been pursuing this type of um, technology sharing um, with some of our allies for a while. So it appears to be a part of uh, administration policy to, to encourage this type of development elsewhere. Uh, there is, uh, now backing out from just gas, there's a property rights issue as well. Um, you know, there are certain concerns with uh, the ability to uh, for mineral rights and so forth and those things um, from what I've read do do raise concerns in other countries because they don't have the same types of uh, property rights regimes that we have um, and that does make it more difficult I think particularly in China and elsewhere um, where that's one of the really big hurdles uh, is not the technology um, or the desire it's simple legal concerns how to get around the property rights issues and, and remember, there's, you know, you guys are focusing on the fuel side. There's also sort of clean technology exports on the generation side, right? I mean, there's a significant demand for that. We manufacture carbon capture and sequestration technologies. Your private sector has put tons of money, billions of dollars, into trying to figure that out, and they've largely succeeded. Because we're not building coal-fired power plants here, and they're still building them overseas, and we're trying to export to them, we can, we can supply that. We can own that IP. We can, we can actually be the ones building them and doing that. Uh, and yet in the Climate Action Plan last year, you basically had an administration-wide ban on helping build a coal-fired power plant overseas. So, you know, we're, they're eating our lunch in that market. And, 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 and our guys, I mean, our, our domestic manufacturers that are doing it, that are making it, that are owning it, are, are losing their ability to actually compete in those markets, which will exist, we just won't be part of it. 
I think we're running up against the time. Um, I've been informed that all of our energy papers outside have been replaced with XM papers produced by Heritage. Uh, and Scott's going to, uh, Ross is going to need an escort outside. Um, but please join me in uh, thanking our panelists today. I appreciate it.